Alors, bonjour à tous et à tous. Euh, je suis Maria Louisa Romano, chef de l'action éducative citoyenne et culturelle au musée McCord. Au nom de l'équipe du musée et de celle de l'École d'éducation permanente de McGill, je vous souhaite la bienvenue à cette troisième rencontre de la série Les dialogues McGill-McCord qui sont présentés dans le cadre du bicentenaire de l'Université McGill, mais aussi en relation étroite avec l'exposition Voix autochtone d'aujourd'hui, Savoir, Trauma et Résilience, qui a ouvert ses portes au public il y a quelques semaines. So I'm Maria Luisa Romano, Head of Education, Community Engagement and Cultural Programs at the McCord Museum. On behalf of the museum team and of the McGill School of Continuing Study, I welcome you to this third lecture uh, in the uh, series, the McGill McCord Dialogues, presented as part of the bicentennial celebration of McGill University and in close connection with the exhibition Indigenous Voices of Today. Avant toute chose, je voudrais reconnaître que le Musée McCord est situé sur un territoire qui est fréquenté et occupé depuis des millénaires par les peuples autochtones et qui n'a jamais été cédé par voie de traité. La nation Guignangueaga démontre toujours un fort attachement envers ce territoire qu'elle nomme Djotjiagé. Et reconnaissant notre passé colonial et ses conséquences désastreuses pour les premiers peuples, le Musée McCord considère qu'il est de son devoir de contribuer à une meilleure connaissance des cultures autochtones et à leur revitalisation. L'exposition Voix autochtone d'aujourd'hui est à l'image de cette intention du musée. Réalisée par la commissaire huron wendat Elisabeth Kane, l'exposition présente une centaine d'objets et d'éloquents témoignages recueillis auprès de personnes provenant des 11 nations du Québec, euh, qui sont situées au Québec. Les objets exposés ont été identifiés par l'Inou Jean Saint-Onge de la Maison de transmission de la culture Inou à Chapoitouane, à, à Ouachat. Et c'est donc la découverte de points de vue et de récits à travers la parole de membres des communautés euh, que le public pourra rencontrer dans ce parcours en trois temps qui aborde les savoirs, les traumas et la forte euh, résilience des peuples autochtones. Afin de faire résonner cette exposition et son propos encore plus largement, l'École de l'éducation permanente et le Musée McCord souhaitent accueillir des invités, donc trois invités, qui exposeront leur parcours et des expériences évocatrices. Euh, donc, nous sommes très fiers de nous associer à l'École de l'éducation permanente à travers cette série qui a d'ailleurs été initiée le 30 septembre dernier avec la présentation de Wanda, Wanda Gabriel dans le cadre de la Journée de la vérité et de la réconciliation. Aussi, euh, nous souhaitons poursuivre cette réflexion au-delà de cette journée commémorative et faire en sorte de poursuivre le dialogue sur des questions et des enjeux qui demeurent cruciaux à chaque instant. Et c'est euh, le, le but de, notre, de la suite de cette série qui se poursuit aujourd'hui. Uh, I will do now give the floor to Dr. Carola Weil, uh, Dean of Continuing Study at McGill University. And just before, I want to sen uh, sincerely thank again uh, Carmen, uh, Dr. Carmen Cecilia, Associated Professor and Director of Indigenous Relations Initiative, Paula Bernardino, Chair of School of Continuing Studies for the ben Bicentennial Committee, and uh, so many other members of the, of the school we worked uh, really hard together in the last uh, months and a week to put together this series. So thank you to all of you. Uh, thank you for Nakuset also for being here today. Thank you. Merci, Maria Luisa. Welcome, bienvenue, Sego, Tansi, Tungasugit. My name is Carola Weil, Dean of Continuing Studies at McGill University. And I echo the thanks uh, just expressed uh, by the museum to your presence here today. Thank you also to Madame Suzanne Sauvage, President, and Gilaine Picard, Chair of the Board, and the staff of the McCord Museum for hosting us today. Today, we broadcast and are gathered here from Jyotiage, also known as Montréal the traditional territory of indigenous people, including the Haudenosaunee Anishinaabe Nation. McGill honors, recognizes, and respects these nations as the traditional stewards of the land and waters from which we host today's event. In the spirit of the longhouse or gathering place that used to bring people from all over together in Kanagawa. We recognize that when we stand together, we can have more positive impact. As we celebrate the beginning of McGill University's third and McCord Museum's second century, we have an opportunity to reimagine the role that institutions of learning and culture like McGill University and the McCord Museum can and should play 
in the life of our diverse society. This is also an opportunity for Miguelians to reinforce ties with our neighbors and local communities across the city, the country, and the world. So the timing was perfect to partner with our neighbors and create the McGill McCord Dialogue series to mark these special anniversaries and to take continuing education and lifelong learning on a journey beyond the ivory tower of higher education. We launched the series last week, as you heard, on September 30th, the National Day for Truth and Reconciliation, with a conversation led by McGill Professor Wanda Gabriel. If you missed the recording of the session, it is available on the SES YouTube channel. I invite you all to consult the school's website to find out more about the dialogue sessions taking place on Thursdays and Fridays in the coming weeks. Tomorrow, you can join Professor Gopi Jayabalaratna, my apologies, course lecturer at the School of Continuing Studies and a specialist in governance issues, accompanied by La Presse reporter Henri Olette Vezina. They will talk about Quebec and Montreal politics and the link to local media, who influences whom and how it serves our society. At the same time, you might appreciate the exhibit here at the McCord Museum uh, of political cartoonist Chaplot. These dialogues are here for you, our community of friends, neighbors, students, alumni, and colleagues to actively engage with the ideas and artifacts and images that McGill, McGill and McCord offer to help shape our own knowledge and the future before us. I want to thank my colleagues both at McGill School of Continuing Studies and at the McCord Museum for their hard work and creativity in standing up this partnership and series. A special word of appreciation goes to Paula Bernardino, Chair of the School of Continuing Studies Bicentennial Committee, and Maria Luisa Romano of the McCord Museum. I will now let my colleague, Dr. Carmen Cecilia, Director of Indigenous Relations Initiative at the School of Continuing Studies, introduce our very special speaker, Nakuse. Thank you, miigwech nakwemu. Wachia, hello, bonjour, Sagan, boy. Nakuset is the executive director of the Native Women's Shelter of Montreal. She created, produced, and hosted the television series Indigenous Power and is the Indigenous columnist for um, Matt TV's TV, uh, City, City Life. In 2014, she was voted as Woman of the Year by the Montreal Council of Women. In 2017, she was selected by the CKX City Series as the Speaker Shift Disturber. I'm going to repeat that, Shift Disturber, due to the work she's, uh, she's done to shift the status quo of urban um, uh, Aboriginal women. In 2018, she testified for three days at the Vienne Commission, a public inquiry into the discrimination of Indigenous peoples of Quebec, and she testified in June 2018 at the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls Inquiry in Calgary. She was um, recently featured in the end of 2010's interview for Global to discuss the past decade work with the urban Indigenous community. Nakuset is honored to have spearheaded and run the Cabot Square project uh, since its inception and to co-found the Resilience Mo uh, Montreal dedicating her work to improving the lives of urban indigenous people. And today, we are honored to have her, he her here with us to talk about how her personal trauma has fueled her into action. Let's welcome Nakuset. Thank you for having me. Thank 
for asking this question. Um, I have three retired persons and I call them my family friends. My parents, my kids, my brother and mother. I call that comfortable greeting um, because it's not really a, a happy story. Um, but I was uh, born in uh, Toronto, Manitoba to a farmer uh, family uh, from La Florence, Saskatchewan. My mother went to the Albert Residential School. She ended up having uh, seven children when she came to the class. So um, because of her experience at residential school, um, she wasn't really allowed to talk about it, but she ended up acting out. So all her kids were removed. And for whatever reason, uh, my sister Sonia, who is three years older than me, um, and I were put in a foster home together. So um, we were very close at a young age. So I guess at around, uh, just before I was about to turn three, um, it was the, <laughs> the government decided to implement uh, the Fit for Kids. So they had this program called the AIM program. Was that the Indian in your tea program? No, still up to you <laughs> to be part of this program which meant that someone came and took a picture of me when I was in my foster, uh, foster home, but they didn't take a picture of Sonia, just me. Because Sonia was considered too old to be in foster care. She wasn't good enough, I think, is what it was. So, but, um, so my picture, all the way from Toronto, Manitoba, ended up here in Montreal in Jewish Family Services. They decided, um, you know, that this policy was going to um, impact all the adoption agencies. So basically they got rid of all the um, white children and only were giving out indigenous children. So my adoptive family had gone to Jewish Family Services probably uh, a year before I was adopted. They chose um, a white boy, adopted him, and then decided they wanted another kid. And when they went back, all they had were um, indigenous children. So they were selected with, you know, this picture book of children and came to my picture and said, we'll take it. So um, I guess the, you know, foster mother got the memo that I was going to be sent away and uh, it was never really discussed. So one morning my sister woke up and I was gone. And she was wondering what happened to me and she was wondering why didn't you say goodbye? Um, she thought maybe our mother came and picked me up and uh, eventually when she was going to be returned to our mom, she would meet me again. But when she was returned to our mother, um, she found out that I was still gone. And it really weighed on her. So she just spent, you know, the next couple of years um, trying to figure out where I was. And what was difficult was because of my mother's trauma from residential school, um, her youngest child, so I'm the second youngest, that Rose was younger than me, um, her father was German and decided to take her um, to uh, Austria. So Sonia, when she was six, lost me, and then when Sonia was 10, she lost Rose. And that really impacted her because she was like, why does everyone leave me? Um, so anyways, I'm here in Montreal at the age of three. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the way the system worked back then was that it was sort of considered like a mitzvah to take these children. Does anyone know what a mitzvah is? I know you do, Gordon. <laughs> but um, yeah, so, you know, my parents, you know, sort of thought I was cute and, and just assumed that I would just fit in really well to this family, but they didn't consider the trauma that I had been through. So they were kind of scratching their head and they didn't really know how to, you know, what to do with me. And the social workers back then um, only advised the parents to just change the identity. They just assumed we would all fit in. So, you know, they encouraged the parents not to let them know about their indigenous heritage. Uh, they told my parents to tell me that I was Israeli because I was dark. But because I was, you know, almost three and I had some memories, I clearly understood I was native. And, um, you know, that was, that's how I, I sort of went moving forward. I, I never really bought into telling people I was Israeli. And then I also found it was strange that they would want me 
to say that. Like, why can't I just be proud of who I was? But I think the way society was back then with the way that we are represented in the media, you know, in a negative manner. Uh, most people <laughs> at that time probably got their education through like cowboy and Indian movies. Um, or, you know, if you look at a sociology book and you see the, you know, sort of really sad statistics about indigenous people, um, I think that the idea was if you just don't tell them and immerse them into this new culture, everything will be fine. But it wasn't fine. Um, and that's why probably about 85% of these adoptions failed. So when I say failed, it means pretty much everyone either ran away or they acted out and were put back into the care um, or they died. Um, so it wasn't, uh, terribly, um, it wasn't terribly positive for many although I do know some that had really good experiences, but 85% of us didn't. And, you know, um, I guess, you know, uh, one minute. You know, through this time, I was really searching. So when I say searching, I was kind of like gravitating towards anything that seemed indigenous, right? So it could be like, you know, the Manitoba flag that had the buffalo on it, or a pair of jeans that had like, you know, um, the face of a man with a, with a headdress on it, or uh, watching uh, the beachcombers and seeing um, uh, that character that, uh, that was native. What was his name? I don't know why it <laughs> escapes me. <laughs> Jesse, there we go. Yes, that was his name. I was like, oh my God, an indigenous guy on TV. That's great. Um, so this is sort of how I kind of, you know, got my cultural pride was because I didn't actually have it. I had to sort of find it. And when I went to a private school, um, it was the first time that I, I met Mohawk children. I remember them coming off the bus and they were like beautiful and they knew their language and they knew their culture. And I was like wanting to become one of them, even though I'm Cree and they're Mohawk, I wanted to become one of them. And I still have friends from that time um, when I was 12 years old and I met them. Um, anyways, growing up was pretty uh, difficult um, because you're in a, I was in a home that I was supposed to um, deny my heritage, and I found the older I got, the more harder it got, the more questions. Everyone knew that I, <laughs> that I was different. It was like kind of like the elephant in the room. Um, the only one in my family that really embraced me was my bubby. So she was my mother's uh, father, and uh, she just thought I was the best thing ever. Like every time I walked into a room, her eyes would light up. Uh, anytime I was having difficulty in my home, she was always there for me, always supporting me, thinking I would become like some kind of a superstar one day. And I just, I never saw any of the positive, um, I guess, vision she had for me. I just assumed that um, I was going to grow up to be a drug addict and a prostitute. So my parents used to do this thing. I guess it was like reverse psychology, but that's what they would tell me. It's like, well, you're if you really want to be an Indian, then you know you should know that your people end up just drinking and doing drugs and are prostitutes. And why would you want to be that? But I knew that that wasn't the reality of it. Like I knew something in that did not seem right. I didn't question them. I just sort of kept it to myself. But um, I knew in my heart that that wasn't the truth. Anyway, by the time I was 18, everybody knows that magical age of 18 is when you can leave. Uh, that's what I did. I just, I was like, I need to find, I need to find something different. I need to figure out who I am, where I fit in this world. You have to understand as a child, when I would fill out applications and it would ask your nationality, I used to like mark off white, right? So that was the way I was brought up. Um, I need to figure out who, I was and where I was from. And, you know, I had tiny little recollections that I had a fa an indigenous family, but, you know, I needed to, to find out more. And the news that I got from my adoptive parents was I, d I had no family. 
the thing is that um, that wasn't true, and my bubby knew that. So what was really sad was that um, we became, we spent much more time uh, with each other after I left home, and um, then she found out that she had cancer, and that was really, um, really hard for me because she was sort of like my anchor. She was the only one that I can go to. Um, and I was really afraid of what would happen once I no longer had that connection. So it was her idea to, she knew that I had family. So she helped me track down my indigenous family. And we did this like letter uh, writing campaign where I wrote to, um, I found some kind of documents that had a listing of siblings. So I wrote to all of them and one wrote back. And he told me that he used to change my diapers. So it's interesting how, you know, the 60s scoop, I didn't actually have to be adopted. Like, I had family that could have taken care of me, but the whole process of adoption was to just put me into a white family, and then I would no longer have my uh, status. And then, you know, because I get $5 a year for being an Indian, that's the treaty. I'm not sure why they didn't, you know, in do the inflation since it was signed in 1876. But, you know, I get these benefits and I think that every time we get disen disenfranchised, we lose those benefits and the government gets to keep that pot of money. So um, I ended up, my bubby sent me a, a ticket to go back home and you know, I met my biological mother and I met my sister Sonia, which was like the best thing ever because she had been looking for me all that time. And the thing is that, you know, when you meet your sister and because of everything uh, that had happened in the past, you know, her first words for me was, I took a lot of beatings for you, which is not um, exactly how I expected that reunion to, to sort of come about. And, um, you know, I felt really guilty because I was just a little child and she was trying to protect me. And then what I did was I showed her the paperwork that I got from Youth Protection where it has sort of like my case history. And in the case history, there was all kinds of descriptions of additional abuse that had happened. So when I showed it to her, it was my intention to just sort of, this is a piece of my past that I found, check it out. But when she read it, she realized that she hadn't protected me enough. And that just made her fall to the ground. And I felt so bad. I was like, Sonia, I'm fine. Look, 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 there's not a mark on me. I'm fine. Like, whatever happened back then, I'm good now. But um, that was something that my sister carried and carried, like, for her entire life, that guilt, that, um, you know, being a witness to the kind of abuse. And I have sort of the luxury of not having any of those memories. For whatever reason, I don't remember anything, which used to bug Sonia so much. She'd be like, don't you remember the time when I did this and we did that? And I'm like, nope, I don't remember anything. So, one sec. So Sonia and I, uh, you know, be, she was living at that time in, uh, she was going from like Winnipeg back to uh, Kenora, moving back and back and forth, working in different organizations. Um, sometimes we would get together when we would, um, if I had a meeting through my work in that area, you know, I would go in and see her. So we tried to get together on occasion. We kept in touch through writing uh, or through phone. And we ended up doing, you know, some projects together. Sonia and I had actually written our stories on this online magazine called Working It Out Together, and Sonia was an amazing writer, but she was always looking for Rose, right? So um, I knew I had another sister. Uh, Sonia always called her Snow White because she had like really dark hair and white, white skin since her father was uh, German. And she knew that she was, you know, um, in a different country. So through Facebook, she ended up finding her. And I remember when, <laughs> when she first found her, um, she sent her a message, but she didn't actually get the message because it went to some other 
I don't know, it was filtered out as some, as junk or something like that. So Sonia was really annoyed. She's like, I know it's her. I keep writing to her. She's not answering me. And I was feeling like, hey, like, like I'm very protective about Sonia. I don't know who this Rose is. I know she's my sister, but she's, she's ignoring Sonia. So I would write letters in a more sort of diplomatic sort of harsh tone. Like, I'm your other sister and Sonia is reaching out to you and you should... <laughs> You should respond to her. Anyways, eventually Rose figured it out and was so happy, right? And she was just thrilled. And um, we ended up having this reunion. And uh, I remember, for whatever reason, I had put it on Facebook that I found Rose. And Rose actually looks a lot like me. Sonia doesn't look that much like me, but Rose really does. Um, and then CBC decided that this was a story, and then they like recorded us having our reunion sort of through radio, where poor um, poor Rose with her German accent, you know, like she she barely <laughs> she barely spoke English, but she was really cute because she was like, the Crees, they are the most beautiful of all the Indians. I'm like, yes, you did your uh, <laughs> you did your research. That's right. <laughs> But, um, but you know, everything sort of falls apart, right? Because, I mean, we were really happy for a while. But I think that, you know, it triggered something in both, uh, you know, Rose and Sonia. And Sonia was more <sighs> devastated by the fact that she couldn't, um, that she had lost everything. That all these memories that we could have had were gone that everything was taken from us. And Rose, who you know had been living, her story was that um, her father dropped her off in Austria when she was about 10 with his parents and then came back to Canada. So she's the only Cree in Austria, doesn't speak the language, and with you know these grandparents that don't really like her so much. And then he didn't come back for like five years. So she just waited every day at the window for him to come home. So me and Sonia, we're all living as children, we're our, our teens, we're all living this like crazy experience, all different, but with all sort of similar themes, right? Um, but for whatever reason, um, I, Sonia and I were able to sort of make it in our work. So Sonia always worked for, you know, either the band council or something like that. She was able to really sort of establish herself in an organization. And I started working at the Native Women's Shelter in 1999. And um, I was able to just sort of move through the organization. And, and um, I mean, I don't have that much of an education. I have like a BA, a bad attitude. No, I have a, a BA in, in human relations. Um, but... Um, I knew because of the experience of being in Montreal and knowing what Indigenous people need and seeing that there was a real gap in services, I've always been that kind of person to be like, is someone going to do something about it? And I look around the room, and if nobody steps up, then I step up. So um, that's what I started to do at the shelter. And because of my experience with youth protection... Um, I was like, what is going on at youth protection? I used to do intakes. So every time a woman comes into the shelter, we always ask, were you as a child in youth protection? Yes. Do you have children? Yes. Are your children in youth protection? Yes. Well, what happened to you as a child that you were in youth protection and now that you are a mother, your kids are in youth protection, why is there this, um, this like, issue and why is it growing like why isn't it not lessening so I used to go to youth protection have conversations with them about this I used to ask them like what is the why does this keep happening what is happening to the kids in care that when they become adults they feel that they can't be good parents um, and I didn't really get a lot of answers so I had a very long <laughs> <laughs> uh, history with youth protection trying to make things right. Um, and I think that this is sort of what I do in, in all the different aspects of my work. I literally go into work and I feel like, who am I fighting today, right? Is it the police? Is it youth protection? Is it, you know, um, language issues? It's like it's always something, you know? And 
um, it's it became sort of natural that this is the kind of work that we end up doing because every day there's a need and every day if you don't address it, it becomes ignored and then you see the implications on the people. So, you know, I started the Cabot Square project, I started the Ishkwe project on missing and murdered indigenous women. It just seemed like every time there was a void, um, it needed to be filled and nobody seemed to have the intent or the um, strength or the knowledge to do it. And I really feel like if we just wait for the government to, to implement these things, it's never going to happen. So we have to push forward. And, you know, I, I feel lucky to do this kind of work because I never do it alone. I know that usually, like, it's just me there. But, <laughs> you know, where I've come is because I've always been able to reach out to a group of people and just throw out an idea and they're able to help me hone it. And then when it's really perfect, then I bring that to the table because I know what it takes to get things done. Um, and that the draft idea I usually have isn't going to work unless it's super polished. So I have a group of people that, you know, have different expertise and I bring it to them and they really, really help me. And I do this all the time. So even if I have to do like a press conference, I usually do two run throughs before I do the press conference, right? Like it has to, you only have one chance to make a good impression. So I have to make sure that I knock it out of the ballpark every single time. Because I think that, you know, when you're indigenous, you know, there's this sort of systemic discrimination against us. And people, you know, can look at us sort of as, um, you know, less than, which means that you have to really up your game so that, you know, you get their attention and then you have to deliver the message and it has to be really, really strong. Um, I guess I feel like um, when things happen in Montreal, um, and especially when, when people are sort of, um, sort of cast aside or even die, um, that something has to happen with that. So um, I know that when the open door left the area of Cabot Square, there was about 10 deaths. So from December until I guess about May, um, and about maybe seven or eight of them were indigenous people, people that I know. And I really love the Cabot Square project, so it really hurt me to see that all these people were dying. And they're dying because they don't have the right advocacy, and they're dying because they don't have an organization they can literally walk into when someone can sort of, you know, assess them and say, hey, are you going to follow up on this doctor's appointment? Are you going to follow up on this? Do you need me to take you? Do you need to rest? Do you need to do this? There was nothing in that area. I already had you know, David Crane, who is the um, Cabot Square outreach worker, but he's one person walking around. Um, I used to meet with the city and we would talk about this issue of like when this organization leaves, nothing is going to be there. Um, we need to do something. And I remember even asking David to start um, taking statistics. When this organization leaves, will you go to the new location so that we have numbers so we can show them, look, there is something bad that's going to happen. We have the numbers. You need to do something. But nobody really, nobody did anything. Um, and then people started to die. And I remember going back to these tables with the city with about 20 or 30 other organizations and just the despair of the workers that were like, I can't do my job in a good way. I meet people on the street that are completely passed out and I can't drag them to an organization that's across the across town. My own, only other option is to call the police. That is not an option. Like, why does that have to be the option? People were, like, giving up. And, you know, I mean, like I said, I have an education. So, you know, I meet with um, politicians and have this discussion. And then I meet with, you know, organizations and have this discussion. And then I write proposals and I try to do something. And nothing is working. What works? A guy by the name of Christopher Curtis. Because when I felt like nothing was actually going to happen, um, I gave him a call and I said, I know you've written about Cabot Square before, so can you write about it again? 
and I will show you the different workers that are having difficulty. I, I can lead you to the different people that are really struggling to try to make a difference. Um, but nobody seems to really care about this. So can you just bring, like, alert the population to what's happening? So I remember, you know, Chris did write a story. Um, I think it was, like, on May 19th. And within three days... <laughs> The city called it a humanitarian crisis, and we're like, now we're going to have a solution. And I cried when that happened, because I was like, that's not what my education taught me. They didn't say, go to Christopher Curtis and have him write an article, and things will change. I did everything I had to do to make a change, and nothing worked. This is my solution? Okay, well, it's a good thing that I, at least I have a solution, but I was just sort of perplexed with the idea that this is how things change. But they change. So the thing with um, the city was since they had the solution, they went back to this table where, you know, we sit with about 30 different organizations and they, they brought it to the table. They're like, okay, everyone, now we have a solution, we have money and we should do something. All right, so who's going to do something? I'll do something. All right, now I'm really busy. <laughs> You know, at the shelter, I have multiple, multiple projects. If you don't believe me, ask Gordon, because he's the guy who does our uh, audits. <laughs> we drive him crazy with all these projects. But anyway, um, like I'm busy. I don't have time to do this. But you, if there's an opportunity that's put in front of you, you have to, you have to jump on it. So... I was able to, to take it on. I was able to find a couple of partners. And then there was a time where I needed to sort of vision. I'm like, what would be the perfect organization in that area? What would it look like? What kind of services would it offer? So even though we got the green light from the city in like May, we couldn't actually find a location uh, until October. So it did give us time to actually create uh, a vision and also the money that the city was offering was like nothing. <laughs> so I had to like go around and sort of pitch the idea to other people. But, you know, what I liked about the idea of this organization is that um, because I've been working in this field for so long, when I first started working at the Native Women's Shelter, there were two women that I worked closely with. Um, and today they're still on the street. Okay. So this is 1999 I started, and they're still on the street. I'm like, how have you survived on the street for all this time? So what I wanted to do was like, you know, talking with my partners is we're going to call this place Resilience Montreal because we are going to honor them when they walk in the door and say, we understand that it's been hard to be on the street, and this is what we've created for you. So we were lucky to work uh, with the uh, Architecture Sans Frontier that I, <laughs> I'm really bossy, but I sat down with them and I'm like, this is the vision that I have. And I'm like, as soon as you walk into the building, what is the color that immediately calms you down? That's the color that it has to be. They're able to put like a living wall, um, which I never even heard of, but it's a thing. Um, they were able to make the place look very bright. I mean, when, I mean, obviously it's COVID, but when Resilience actually opened, um, like a couple of days later, people would walk in thinking it's a high-end cafe. And then they would see the population and be like, oh, it's not for me. Um, but that is what we need to do. We need to sort of, if you change the environment and you offer more, then people will make different choices. So that was the whole idea of resilience is that we're going to change the environment so it's going to be beautiful. Um, we're going to offer really, really good food, which comes from my bubby. <laughs> um, and also, because of the Viennes commissions, right? So that commission with the recommendations came out in 2019. You know, I know that uh, they say that 68 have been accomplished. I'm not seeing it, right? But what we want to do with resilience is to make sure that we have all those services at their disposal. So they can come in and they can have a shower and they can, you know, rest or they can eat or have a change of clothes. But we would also have, you know, the experts come in that are in housing on one day and then addictions on the other day and then doctors on another day 
um, justice, uh, wellness, right? I mean, when does, you know, someone who's homeless ever get to have like reflexology or something like that? Never. So why don't we offer that or give haircuts or, you know, other kinds of, um, of workshops? So before COVID, that was the idea. Um, and um, people were really great. We were able to sort of bring in different people, like, you know, Foster's Pavilion said that they would bring people in and make sure that, you know, if someone wanted to go for, get treated for addictions, they would be on the top of the list. So um, I only have like five minutes left. So I guess the whole sort of point is that, you know, I didn't come from uh, a very supportive um, indigenous family. And then, you know, my adopted family had some challenges as well. Um, but you only have one life. And I think that if I was able to make it to where I am today, um, that you have to do something more. You, are, you have the privilege of being able to navigate through all this trauma and you've been able to make some success. So you need to keep plowing forward. Oh, so the thing about my sister was that um, when the government decided that they were going to start giving money to people that were part of the 60s scoop, um, she thought she was eligible, but she found out that she wasn't because she wasn't actually adopted. And that really put her more in a depression. So she had sent me like a suicide video saying, if you see this, it's because I'm dead. But what I need is for you to use your voice. Um, and you need to let people know about how damaging youth protection is and how the system hasn't changed and that we need to have change for the, the future generations. And she begged me to use my power to keep going. So I honor my sister and I work really, really hard to continue because I am still here. I have now just recently outlived her. Um, and there's so much work to do. Like, I really feel sometimes like I haven't even scratched the surface. Um, but I have a lot of momentum and I have a lot of allies and I have a lot of support. So, you know, I think the next 15 years, you know, we're going to continue on this momentum and, uh, you know, ask me to come back then and <laughs> we'll see what I've done with my time. So thank you all for listening. Um, and uh, I guess if you have questions, you can probably ask him now. Thank you, Nagasette, for that. Uh, You're not allowed talent. to ask questions, Gordon. <laughs> yes, I am. Yes, I am. I can say that to you. <laughs> um, I always appreciate hearing your story. Um, and I hope your children are doing well. Uh, given this current situation with, uh, with Batshaw, uh, and, and it's, it's a continuing litany of organizations that don't that don't step up and don't meet the standards that they should be what is the path forward what, what do you what's what's your vision for that and, and where are we going with that and how do we overcome these situations well what's difficult is that it needs to come from the top and what I was doing with batch I was meeting the people at the top and the people at the top were like placating me. Mm hmm, yeah, mm hmm, sure, yep, yep. <laughs> and you can only get that so much treatment like that. And when you have to just walk away, it's like, I'm not an idiot. Why are you treating me this way? Why are you treating all of us this way? Why aren't you listening to, to the reports? Why aren't you applying the Viennese Commissions? Why aren't you applying the Laurent Commission? Why aren't you applying the TRCs? Oh, so that's why the Native Women's Shelter is opening a second stage housing, so we'll have the Dr. Julian Foundation. So that's social pediatrics, which means that 
anyone who, okay, so if you think of the Native Women's Shelter as the crisis, that's the first step. The second step is you're out of your crisis and you're ready to live independently in a beautiful apartment with your children. But if you're having issues with youth protection, we have a clinic downstairs, or we will have one because it's not fully built yet, another 12 months or so, um, that you can go to and they will evaluate the child and bring in all the experts. So bring in a doctor and a lawyer and a social worker and a physiotherapist and a speech therapist and art therapist and whatever it is that they need. And that team goes to youth protection. So they're protected by a professional team and it's like, what's the problem now? Why can't they stay? Why can't they be reunited? And this works in other indigenous communities. So we have to create our own solutions because I don't know when the light bulb is going to go off at youth protection. Um, and I, I, need to see, I need to see some kind of change because working at the shelter and watching the women suffer and, um, you know, getting off the phone with youth protection and screaming and crying to their room or having their kids removed when they haven't looked elsewhere to see if there's other family or um, not allowing the children to come back with the mother at the shelter, like it almost seems as if they think that we are unqualified. And I ensure that, you know, I have an addictions worker and a family care worker and a psychologist and an art therapist and an elder. Like I make sure that we have all the experts in the field to surround the women. Um, but it's not enough for them. They still don't want to sort of work with us. So things have to change, right? So I think if you look at the top top at the Legault government, if he's not going to admit to systemic racism, then a lot of people are in the same boat. So they're like, no, no, it's all good. Everything, you know, the status quo is fine when we know it's not. Um, and then you have to almost, you know, I mean, I... I saw an article recently that uh, I guess the Minister of Youth is going to go and have a conversation with Youth Protection. I'm like, well, maybe we should be having a conversation with him as well. Before he <laughs> learns from Batchel what's going on, he can also read the reports. But the thing is that all the reports are written. He can look at the VN's commissions. I think there's 29 recommendations for Youth Protection and ask them why they haven't implemented it. Um, and what's really difficult is that, you know from what I'm hearing on youth protection, that's sort of like, well, we're not moving fast enough. Well, it's two years. Why do we have to wait X amount of years before you do something? If we are overrepresented in the child welfare uh, system, why does it take so long for any change to happen? And um, so I think there is going to be a bit of a shakeup. And I have some like um, other moves, but you'll read about it in a couple of weeks. Are there any other questions of the audience? Thank you very much for a very moving story. Um, I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit to this, um, the reconnecting with uh, indigenous communities. You mentioned uh, the story of women who have been on the streets for what sounds like decades. Um, are you trying to then reconnect individuals back with their home communities or are we in fact creating a new community here where the people are so are we what ultimately do you want people to stay but feel that they are part of a community or are we trying to bring indigenous members who have been taken away from their home communities back to their home communities, and how can we help with that? Well, it's a really broad question, because every single person has a different story as to why they left their community, and every community is different. So, you know, you can have communities that have no running water, and you can have communities that have, you know, their own social services, their own hospitals, schools, daycares, whatever. So it all depends on which community they come from. There's also a lot of generational trauma in the communities. So they might have left their community because of trauma, come to Montreal for a better life, and go back and forth. 
So a lot of times people come to the Native Women's Shelter almost for respite care. They're like, we know you have all these services. We're going to send a woman up with her child to use all these services and to get well, and then they're going to return to their community. So, I mean, it's really up to the individual. Like, I'm not going back to my community. I like it here. <laughs> I would not survive in Lac La Ronge. I don't have a car. <laughs> like, you know, I don't speak Cree. They mostly speak Cree there. I, I would not survive there, right? So um, what we're trying to do is, you know, honor the choices that people make. If they want to live here, how can we make it comfortable for you? If you're having difficulty, how can we help you with any of the decisions that you're going to make? Um, but um, I guess the work that I do is is more for people that are going to live in the city of Montreal and trying to create safer spaces because the whole city is being, especially around Cabot Square, is being completely changed. It doesn't look anything like it used to. And, you know, we were, were, were forced out. And uh, we need to make sure. Like, I was really lucky to be able to get monies for resilience. So... The building we're in now is going to be plowed into a condo, created eventually. Um, so I needed to find a secondary location. And, you know, for whatever reason, I was able to get 3.6 from the province, which I didn't ask for, but thank you very much. And then the same thing from the feds, because usually you have to fill out applications. It was just like, by the way, we're giving this to you. Great. So... You know, we were able to buy a, a building that is ridiculously beautiful. And now we're going to be renovating it um, and, and putting in a basement and really making it a wellness center. So people are going to feel when they come in that they're at the rich uncle's house. Right. But this is what we have to do. We're changing the entire look and the architects we're working with, uh, again, um, is actually consulting with Inuit communities, First Nations communities, and the homeless community. They're like, what does home mean to you? How can we build it into here? And I've never worked with a group of architects that have ever consulted the homeless community for their vision. So I love these people. The woman, her name is Claire Davenport. She's going to win an award when this comes out. Like, there's going to be a red carpet <laughs> when we do our unveiling. And it'll be all the, the people on the list to come in will be the homeless population and then the rest that, you know, maybe I'll put Gordon on the list. But, um, you know, like everyone else is going to have to wait because this is their home. This is going to be their oasis and this is going to be their opportunity to thrive. It's up to them if they want to or not, but everything will be at their disposal for them to become strong. Because, again, we can't wait for the government to be like, oh, now we're going to do it. I'm like, Ugh. I've heard that story. I'm getting old. Anyway. Hi, Nakusat. Thank you so much for sharing your story with us. I'm just wondering, um, in terms of Canadians who want to be allies, um, what can you recommend uh, for sort of the average Canadian? What can they do to help support um, Indigenous peoples in Canada? There's so much to do. Um, it, first of all, it all depends where they live. You're saying Canadians. You're talking about all of Canada. Well, there's always Indigenous organizations all over. Um, so they should either volunteer or donate uh, to those organizations. Uh, I'm really preoccupied these days with the mass graves, though. Like, they used to have the Nuremberg trials for those that were part of the Holocaust. And people were, like, pulled out of old age homes and put into wheelchairs and brought to court. I want to do that for these kids. So if anyone has any ideas how you do that, let me know, because no one's, no one's moving towards that, right? But that has to happen. We have to rewrite history. There are people that are still alive that built, that like dug that first grave. So it's sort of like, okay, uh, who said you should do this? Who told you it was a good idea? And why did you keep it from the family and have them testify? I'm not saying they have to go to jail, but we need to rewrite history. And that needs to happen, right? Because it's really strange where you have like a government that's like, September 30th is your day and I'm going on vacation. Like, what are you? <laughs> like, you can't give us these days and then not be participatory in it, right? So, um yeah, I think that there's a lot of work to do, um, but really supporting organizations that are doing the work is what is best. Is that it? Nope, there's one. Okay. Uh, wh where will your new center be? 
I cannot say. We have to do like this. Um, sometimes people don't like it when we move in because they want the not in my backyard, right? They don't like the homeless population. So we need to do a cohabitation plan, which is already done in draft, but needs to be tightened up. Then we have to present it to the borough. Then people feel comfortable. But we're very aware of the fact that people don't want to see us, which is why in this building that we got, um, we have a humongous outside balcony, a terrace. It's huge. Everyone's going to go there. If they want a cigarette, if they want to hang out, they do it there. We're going to have like a special sort of beautiful fencing, um, very decorative so no one can actually see into the building. Um, and, and that, so they won't be on the streets. They're not going to be in the alleyways. They're going to be upstairs. We'll be, you know, sitting outside with them. There's even going to be a fireplace out there. Like I'm telling you, <laughs> we're going to treat them like, you know, like it's going to be like a bit of a, like a wellness center. They're going to feel well when they walk in. And then again, it'll be up to them to decide if they want to take the, you know, the, the professional services that are there when they're ready, it's there. If they just want to come for some good food and that's there too. So I think yeah, we're pretty much done. They, I have to yeah. run. Nick said, I want to thank you so much. Um, we've come to the end of uh, your uh, talk. Very inspiring. I really want to uh, thank you so much for, uh, for uh, uh, your sharing and um, honoring your sister through your work. Um, thank you. Uh, I'm sure that uh, she's, uh, she knows. She definitely knows. Um, I um, I just want to uh, also remind everyone that next week, October 14th, we have David Ako, who is president and uh, founder of Ako Systems. And uh, he is going to be talking about reframing indigenous relations through um, economic reconciliation. So thank you for uh, coming. Uh, for those of you who are online, thank you for joining us. Merci, miigwech, uh, niawen, uh, nakumik. <laughs>